All right. Let me get us started. Um, all right. Hey, everybody. It's so good to be here with y'all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for adding us to your to-do list and coming to jam out with us for our Culture First Ask Me Anything. And let me tell you, Jesse and I are not only we're excited about Beyonce's, you know, new album, but we're also very excited by the panelists that we have joining us today. Like one of our, our goals here in the Culture First community is to amplify others. And my goodness, honestly, I feel like we're going to be amplified today, to be quite honest with you. So thank you to our panelists who are here today. And thank you to everyone who's here with us. And Jesse and I, we bear no introduction. I think many of you know who we are, but um, just to reintroduce ourselves, um, my colleague, Jesse Jacobs, who run our Culture First uh, Global Chapters here, over 105 global chapters in 83 cities, 21 countries, 12,000 members, 150 chapter leads. Not a small task, but my girl, she does it. <laughs> and I'm Demario Bell. I manage our People Geek Slack community, almost 40,000 members hailing from all over the globe. And we're just so honored to be able to jam out in our Culture First community with y'all. So thank you so much for being here. And we're also very grateful that we're going to be co-hosting today's um, discussion with our partners over at Charter. And thank you so much, Emily, for being here to represent Charter. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Charter, this is your first time learning about them. Let me just say they're a fantastic team. I first saw Emily um, present at one of our, our Culture First San Francisco um, Leaders Forum back last October, I believe it was. Impressed. Like, we all consume a lot of content. And I am a former English major. I went to school, got a degree in English, and I love literature. And I consume a lot of content. Let me tell you, Charter is the real deal, hands down. But they're a team of experienced leaders who are at the intersection of business, talent, research, and journalism, dedicated to reshaping the future of work. Very, very similar to our mission here at Coltramp. So you can imagine why we're putting on this webinar together. Um, it was founded in 2020 by Kevin, Aaron, and Jay. I've happened to meet three-fourths of the founders, um, but Charter provides um, comprehensive coverage of modern workplace dynamics, actionable research. Emily and her team are amazing. Let me just, the, the research that they produce is outstanding. Um, premium memberships and advisory services, their approach bridges research of practical guidance, offering solutions grounded in rigorous research and forward thinking insight. So super honored to be hosting this uh, webinar with our partners over at Charter. And if you want to learn more about them, go to charterworks.com and click on that about tab. We can learn a little bit more about what they do. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Jesse. He's going to talk a little bit more about what we do in our Culture First community. Woohoo. All right. Thanks to Mario. Um, I'm Jesse Jacob. Um, if this is your first uh, culture first chapter gathering. Welcome. Um, if you're like, who are these people? What is it you say we do here? Uh, well, we're a group of people around the world united in the sugar belief that a better world of work is possible. And I'll go one step further and say, by golly, we're willing to do something about it. Um, we have five core principles. So as Demario mentioned, we have over a hundred global chapters now at this gatherings about future of work trends. Um, but we ask that we embody these five core principles at all of our gatherings. So today we ask you to show up with this sense of fostering belonging and acceptance, this idea of like letting everyone show up and be seen, valued, and appreciated for just being them. We ask that you have the willingness to reflect and grow. If that if we're on this mission to transform the future of work, um, that goes to our organizations doing the work, but ultimately that starts with us being the change we want to see in the world. So going through this and thinking, what can I do? What's what, what impact can I have? Having the courage to be vulnerable. We're constantly wearing these masks and different layers at work. And so being willing to play with your edge of vulnerability today and shed some of those layers uh, and be a human here. And it gives other people people uh, the chance to do that too. It creates more trust and psychological safety with one another on this mission. Putting learning into action. We don't want you to just consume content and have it go in one ear and out the other. We want you to be inspired to put your learnings into action. So keep the conversation going, whether it's in People Geek Slack or on LinkedIn. Um, we want to hear how you are implementing what you learned into your life or to work, whatever that looks like. And the last value that we ask is connection inside, business outside. 
It's a fancy way of saying that in the context of this gathering, we ask that you connect first as human beings. And if that leads to you all doing business later, that's cool. But uh, hard selling and pushing our businesses to one another is not the primary purpose of the gathering. We're here to just get to know one another, learn, uh, grow, and do this work together. And uh, hopefully that leads to us doing amazing work outside of this too. All right. So with that, if you've been to a Culture Ramp event, you have seen our belonging badges, these physical pins that we wear. Um, and they're just amazing ways for us to label and identify ourselves, um, maybe past what meets the visible eye. And so we want to have you all check in uh, with a couple badges today as our uh, opening connection session. So um, pick two or three of these that you identify with, and we want you to drop them in the chat. So, um, and you can also, there's a blank badge here too. So you can choose your own adventure. Maybe you're like, I'm a Leo or I'm a <laughs> three wing two, or, uh, my favorite one to make up is I'm single. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's my belonging badge. <laughs> I know. I just hung out with two of our community members from the San Diego chapter and they met from a culture first event. And I was like, Oh, culture first love. It can happen. Uh, so anyway, I love it. So Rob, pick two to three badges, drop them in the chat. Would love to see how you all are identifying today, whatever that looks like for you. And again, playing with that edge of vulnerability, having the courage to be vulnerable, but what does that look like for you? Oh, they're coming in the chat too. I'm loving it. Let's let's see who's in the chat. All right. Oh, Arthur Chan is here. Hey, Arthur. Good to see you, friend. <laughs> Oh, we need we need like a, a guest feature section. So good to see you. Oh, I'm loving these that are coming in the chat, Jesse. Thank you so much. And and I'll share mine. I'm showing up today as a first generation college grad. I wear that badge very, very proudly. Um, and I and, and another one that I'm wearing proudly today is that um I'm basking in joy. That's the, I'm gonna write that one in, Jesse. I'm basking in joy. So <laughs> I'm going to keep us moving along. Please continue to put your belonging badges in the chat. And Jesse, I'm going to hand it back over to you to introduce briefly who are our panelists today and what we're going to be talking about. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I, uh, as Demario mentioned, I'm so grateful that we have the honor to amplify some amazing humans uh, <laughs> through this platform that we have through the Culture First community. So excited to have Emily, Tara, and Teresa here with us. Um, oh. Am I, let's see, Demario, where did I have my? We can see you. Oh, okay. Well, Emily obviously is the head of research and uh, senior vice president at Charter. She's an electric. I've had an honor and a treat to get to know her and I'm hoping to get to know her even better, but really excited to learn from her today. Uh, Tara, whoa, trailblazer. Talk about just incredible human in the DEI space. I'm always learning incredible things from her. And again, hoping to get to know her better as well. And my girl, Teresa, oh my gosh, she started a chapter in New York City a long time ago. Now she runs a Norwalk chapter. She's helping with the book club and she's an expert in the AI space and I'm continuously learning from her. So, so excited that you all are here. Thank you for collaborating with us. Um, I'm, I'm going to sit back and take some damn notes. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> right, thank you, Jesse. I am going to stop sharing my screen because we're going to get right into the conversation for today. And Jesse, if you don't mind pinning the the five of us to the channel, that would be great. Um, let me just pull up my questions here. Oh, all right. Panel, are y'all ready? All righty. Let's, let's dive in. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Ready. So well. All right, so I'm going to kick us off with our first question, and 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 Emily, I'm going to just start with you. And the first question that I have for you, you know, AI is everywhere. Like that topic is coming up in almost every space that we're in. And I remember, you know, not a, just a few years ago, where Bitcoin and crypto was very big, and people thought that was going to revolutionize how we do transactions. And now AI is the big topic. And but we know that AI has been around since the 1950s. And so my question to you is like, what's the most overhyped aspect of AI today, and why? Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, thank you, Culture Amp, for your incredible work. Um, and my immediate reaction to this question is, 
Let's not expect that work will immediately become painless. Don't expect that the first time you use ChatGPT, there's going to be a revolution in your or your colleague's work overnight. Training and experimentation is, is a real must. I think the, a lot of the hype that we're hearing is around expectations of immediate productivity gains. And we really like to frame AI usage in terms of raising the quality of work and workers' autonomy instead of efficiency and cost cutting. Um, and, and I'm really thrilled to be with people who also think about the benefit of artificial intelligence in our workplaces is around work quality, not just higher productivity. Spot on one. Thank you, Emily. So spot on one. Teresa, Tara, what would you add to that? Yeah, I I think that I, I totally agree with what Emily said. I'm definitely on the same page. I think in my mind, because I talk with a lot of leaders that are brand new, have never really even explored ChatGPT. And I think it's so important to reinforce the idea that you do not actually need any special skills or talents or, you know, unique characteristics about yourself to be able to explore and use different generative AI and other AI tools. And I, it's important because there is going to be a change to the world of work as we look into the future. And that perspective of you have to be an expert before you, you know, kick your shoes off, so to speak, is false. And so I spend a lot of my time working to flatten the AI learning curve, working to help leaders know that no matter where you are in your learning journey is the exact place you need to be. All right. So if I'm a lagger, I shouldn't feel bad about not fully adopting AI right now. No, 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 no. You're welcome to the party. Everybody's welcome to the party. All right. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, I would add to that. I think we think about AI as like Oz, right? Like it's like nobody knows exactly like what it is. It's like some being behind a big curtain and can we get back to Kansas? Not, I don't know. And don't know like how this all actually works. And so um, much like Teresa and Emily said, I think there's this perception because there's this uptick because of open AI most recently where everybody's talking about it and it's a buzzword. Yep. We just have to dial it back a little bit with our buzzwords anyway. I mean, you know, there's so many we could talk about in this moment, but what we're really talking about is a new functionality. And this is not something new that's actually happened in society. We always have these great industrial sort of work changes that happen our goal is to like bring everybody along with it so that we're not doing this elitist game where people feel like, oh, you're having this very, you know, this discussion about something that I actually know nothing about. So it's really just making sure that people don't feel isolated from the conversation, that they feel comfortable enough to ask what it is, how do I use it? What's it good for? You know, going even back further than is it going to take my job, but like, what is it? Yes. Yeah. And I think that's where we all are. We're all, you know, tar still trying to figure out and learn like what exactly is it and like what does it mean for us? And I actually want to stay there with you, um, Tara, to go to our next question. You know, what would you say are some of the common challenges organizations face when they're trying to adopt AI, especially from an equity and inclusion lens? I know. And Emily and I have had this discussion and you, Damari, you've been part of these. There are so many times, but I think it fundamentally goes back to how do organization, organizations bring people along in general? So like AI would be part of that strategy too. Like how transparent are you about the strategy of the company, um, you know, mobility, learning and development, how clearly defined are those programs? And then if you add AI into that, because, you know, that would be part of your strategy. It shouldn't be compartmentalized because you know, and, and Emily has said this in some of the amazing charter research, most of the people left behind are going to be black, brown people and older people, older generations, because it's typically we're the ones who are most affected by any kind of monumental change within the organization. They usually forget about us regardless. You know, we're not, um, you know, a lot of us, you know, like I said, I, in my belonging batch, I'm a first generation corporate worker. Like I didn't have a little playbook when I walked into an office to understand like, what's a 401k and like, you know, what are the protocols? And like, if this person means this thing, do they really mean this thing? So there's a lot of like uh, people who are entering the workforce who don't have the secret code or the playbook and AI might be part of that too. So how are you bringing people along on that journey? 
overall, we're in such a precarious environment now where we're stripping back DEI initiatives already because people don't know what they are. We haven't defined what DEI is, me meaning you know globally or even within companies. So if you're saying like what you really care about is everyone having an equitable experience within the organization, that also falls into your learning and development, which folds into how are you bringing people along with the innovation of the company? Like what language are you using? Are you leveraging all of your resources like internal comms and learning and development and your people team to bring these people along to make them feel included? Yeah, and, and there's this real sense of fear among um, marginalized groups, I'm using that term broadly in the workplace, Tari, that if I adopt this, if I use this, what does this mean for my job security? What does this mean for me when I get my hands slapped? So yeah. there's, a, there's a scarcity mindset even around it. So when you talk about groups of folks being left behind, that's, that's a real thing. Um, Listen, I just got my mom to use like FaceTime two years ago. Like literally uh, she was just like, I'm not into that mess. I don't know what that is. Like she, you know, she just, yeah. we have to remember, we have to dial it back and be more simple. I agree. Plus one to that. Emily, right. I'm coming over to you. I love to, love to get some insight into like, what are you all seeing in some of the research that you've done over at Charter? Absolutely. And I'm going to share just two slides. Um, Jesse, I can pull this, those up unless you prefer to. Let me see. Um, oh, wait, I don't know if I have your slides, actually. So I'll make okay. you... We can I'll, make I'll do the honors. And I'll, I'll quickly just say, as I bring those up, that um, in addition to, to the great points that Tara made, you know, we need to recognize that the current discourse around AI can be really exclusionary. And, and this going back to this point of like straightforward language, this technology is not intuitive to all people. Um, and we all learn at different rates. There are a lot of ways that these tools may favor English language users, for example. Um, and so this is a real invitation to just consider the language um, that we use and, and who is brought along in that and who is potentially left out. All right, one moment. Let me just pull this up. Thank you. While you pull it up, what did? Of course. All right. We can see your slides, Emily. Wonderful. Um, I'll keep this quite quick and I'll also drop a, a link in the chat of where individuals can read more about this research. But wanted to share a few stats that I think are are helpful um, in the in the considerations that that we're having. We see really worrying trends um, both in original research at Charter um, and in research that that many of our peers have published, um, seeing the ways that people in underrepresented groups have been historically disenfranchised um, around past technological transformation in the workplace. Um, and we are very concerned about this being perpetuated with generative AI tools. Um, our findings suggest, as you see on screen, that um, we see a, a pretty striking racial gap um, with Black individuals we surveyed, even though many of them are using generative AI at the same rate, if not more than their peers, the, saying that they fear more job precarity um, and, and concerns about being displaced in their work, well-founded fears. We see um, lower use among people who identify as women, and this obviously has ramifications for our financial futures. And lastly, we see a very stark age-related drop-off um, for people 55 and older. And, and really thinking about how to better support their learning curve um, and making sure that they're not disadvantaged by increased usage of automation in, in the workplace. Simply put, it, this does not have to go the way of past technological transformations. And, and the implication for leaders here and for all of you on this call is really to proactively engage with individuals in underrepresented groups, um, people who are least likely historically to have a seat at decision-making around which vendors are we enlisting? Um, who gets to sit on the committees making decisions about, um, about corporate or small business spend? Um, whose concerns are, are really heard and validated? And just one more thing that I wanna share 
with you, um, which is that based on our our reporting, we know that employers have license and actually a responsibility to talk about these technologies, to talk about their benefits and drawbacks. Um, we know that we're in a moment of mutual learning, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later in the in the conversation. Um, I'm wary of any conversation where we are talking about AI as net benefit and a blanket positive for everyone. Let's get into the nuance, and I know that's exactly what we intend to do in this conversation. Wow, very insightful, very, very insightful data, Emily. Thank you so much for sharing what you all have seen at Charter. And I mean, and it really underpins, you know, what you and Tara have mentioned when we think about groups of individuals who will potentially be left behind if we're not thinking about this from an equity lens, how do we adopt this? And I hadn't even thought about it, um, Emily, like from a vendor standpoint, like who are we you, who are we selecting, you know, when we think about adopting AI in our workplaces? So that's... Uh, uh, a nugget that I just learned. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, if I can move us along, Teresa, I want to come to you because you are, you've been really in this space as well. I mean, from like a practitioner standpoint, um, how have you seen HR leaders already adopt and adapt AI in the workplace? Yeah, thank you, Demario. I also wanted to say thank you for having me today. I know I recognize that I failed to do that and I'm so happy to be here with Tara and Emily and you. Um, I think one of the, so I've spent the past year and a half really digging in deeply from an HR perspective um, as a 25 year HR leader myself to thinking and working with HR teams across the country and the world on how they're considering and working to adopt. What I've seen primarily is that in my mind, we're still at the bottom of the bell curve on deep adoption. Um, there's a lot of exploration, which is very exciting to see. Um, a lot of exploration in the tools that we talk about a lot. So the chat GPTs and Claude is certainly rising in its popularity, um, but there are a lot of other tools out there that can have a really intricate and unique impact on organizations because of the specialty functionality that they have. And the way that I've sort of been discussing AI and these various apps is around the way that we use things like our cell phones. You know. Um, very few big box tools, the big HRAS systems, the engagement tools with culture amp excluded, of course, um, I think got on a bandwagon around, oh, let's say that we have these AI tools available and that they're internalized within the systems, but they haven't done a great deal of education on adopting users, how those tools impact the the utilization of that system itself. So one of the things I always encourage HR leaders and the partners that I work with to do is to do a little bit more deep analysis. Ask your providers, what are the unique aspects of AI that are being utilized with my data that's already in this system, oftentimes private confidential data. So you wanna be aware of that. One of the things that Tara mentioned earlier was also, um, the conversation around people, or maybe you mentioned it tomorrow, the conversation around people feeling fearful of their jobs with using AI. What I found across many organizations is that the conversation around AI hasn't been happening the way that we think it perhaps should be happening. So I've met with two enterprise level global organizations. And when I asked a large group of those employees, what has the conversation around AI been? It's been crickets. Um, one team waiting for another team, waiting for IT to say something. And my conversation is always, well, who should be the team that's responsible for starting the conversation around something that will have a huge impact on our culture, the way that we work organizationally, jobs, responsibilities. Um, and so one of the things I've seen HR leaders start to do more often is have start the conversation. And I have some tools that, that can help with that if you're interested or curious, plug that in the chat and I'll get to you. I'll get that to you. But I, I think it is about the general exploration of the tools and then starting to use it for those tasks that um, while long-term strategy is key, but in the short term, I'm seeing a lot of teams use it for those productivity pieces. So um, content development, um, synthesizing of schedules, interview and TA responsibilities, um, you know, I worked with one client where we leveraged generative AI to create an entire year's worth of uh, event content and um, connection 
events, including communication checklists, um, uh, cascade of, of communication to the organization in a half an hour, something that would typically take days every month or at least hours every month to put together. So there are there are ways that we are using, HR leaders are using it more efficiently. Um, but I agree with Emily that in the long term, the efficiency of the tool can't be the guiding metrics for its success. And my message is always, let's just, as HR leaders, AI is a people issue. It's a people change opportunity, not a tech change opportunity. And so HR leaders being those guides through the process for our organizations has been key. So we shouldn't over-index on it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Teresa. Coming over to you, Emily. And um, co-sign what Teresa shared. And um, there's two other things that that we see that I think are instructive in this conversation. The first of which is um many employees and hourly workers alike tell us that they welcome some guardrails. They don't want to be left guessing. If there are policies around safe use, particularly with regard to customer data be very communicative about what those policies are and um, explain the difference between private company operated instances and publicly available chat GPT, for example. And the second thing is there's a lot of value in leaders showing what they're trying, whether those are executives, whether those are team managers. And I'm going to give you just a few quick examples. Um, in a forthcoming guide about AI and worker voice that Charter is publishing, we had the chance to talk to Trina Minduri, who's the VP and Chief Learning Officer at Coursera. And she shared with us that in all staff meetings, um, the CEO of their online course company, um, Jeff Magino Calda, I apologize for the spelling there, especially as a Galagoski, um, Jeff periodically shows his employees the AI prompts that he's testing out. Surprise, they don't always work as intended in a live demo setting. Um, and yet this actually has a really nice effect of demonstrating a growth mindset to the staff. Um, as Trina, the, the VP we interviewed said to us, it lowers the bar for all of us to try things and to take risks. It's one thing to say we support you and it's another thing to say we're really actively engaged in this also. Um, and there's just another example that I wanted to share, which is um, from Humane, the maker of the wearable AI pin. Um, and their CEO, Bethany Borgino, um, who's also a co-founder, tells staff, if there's a better way for us to be working, please raise your hand. And one of their senior people leaders, Angela Rowe, who we interviewed said, you know, I take this to this call for better opportunities and, and savvier ways to work as an opportunity to raise my hand when I find that there are tools that can streamline our processes and share information more easily. And one of the things that she has been really concerned about um, is that as a, as a tech company, they get many more applicants from men than from people who identify as women. And she said, you know, we actually really should put AI to work for us in reviewing our job descriptions, in addition to taking these two relevant ERGs for their readership. Um, and these are, I would say, people like absolutely at the top of their craft. And th they were pretty astounded with some of the language that the, that the um, you know, a bias check revealed. And now they've incorporated that into sort of all of the ways that they that they work. Um, and when it comes to combating bias, I think there is a place where we we know that the technologies, because they are trained on human developed material uh, publicly available on the internet, that they are highly fallible and problematic. We also know that human beings aren't perfect. And so actually, I think this is a match where when we can check one another's bias, candidates and employees win. Spot on, Emily, 100%. I'm looking at Tara and I'm looking at Teresa because it's spot on. I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah. I also I have a question and, and, and to take us off. With this time savings that employees have who are adopting AI, I wonder what are you hearing or what do you assume like some of the, the, the conversations are around that? Like, 
our em employers questioning like now that we were we, we might be adopting AI for these redundant tasks or you know is there this concern around well what are you doing with the other three hours that you probably would have spent you know on that task yeah I was going to say, I, I think that that is that is a huge part of what HR leaders and people leaders need to have as a part of the discourse and the thought process. I mean, as somebody who worked in HR for 25 years, I know that there are there are already a lot of things on the list that we couldn't get to anyway. The a lot of times the sad things that fall off are the culture building and the connectivity and the cre ensuring that people are doing meaningful work that helps them thrive. Yep. So, you know, while we're saving and gaining back hours from the repetitive or administrative work, I think that's where we have to have strategy going into how are we adopting and what are we doing with that time? I would love to believe that as a result of AI, we could all go to a four-day work week and still <laughs> get paid the same. The United States, at least uh, here, that we're ready for that, or that that would be adopted. But there are a lot of other things. The the what people perceive maybe as the nice to have, because they're so bogged down with the have to have. Perhaps some of that gets adjusted, and the the balance is is equalized a little bit more. Yeah. I would love to chime in there to Mario because I saw on Twitter the other day. Yes, I'm still on Twitter. I've talked about this before. I just think there's a group of people who do not feel comfortable or welcome on LinkedIn. So in the, a lot of misinformation is really on the, you know, other social media. So the more of us who can stay there and educate the, the youth and the misinformed, the better, but someone literally tweeted the other day, like, before computers, like what happened? You just went into an office and there was like a phone and like, what else? What what did you, like, how did you communicate? Like, what, what did you do? And see, this is the thing is like, we've had these industrial movements before. Like we have a group of people who literally don't even know what you would do without a computer. So then we're talking about what, at some point, what are you doing without AI? We managed y'all, like there was a lot of paper and there were some adding machines, if I remember correctly, and special fax paper, but nonetheless, we persevered. <laughs> The whole point of all of this is for us to make sure we are bringing everybody along, like moving from the typewriter to the word processor, to the computer, to what you can do with the computer. This is all a journey that we should not just be like, okay, well, you know, we've got our Macintosh, you know, in 64, we're good to go. We're not going to progress any further. This is just one other element or journey, I think, and viewing it that way and talking to people about that and even making scenarios where some people who don't feel comfortable with AI, like remember when you could not book a flight with your phone? Well, here we are, right? Let's just figure out how we can do that more efficiently. And rather than it taking over, using it as a tool, like Teresa and Emily have said. Boom. And just to, just to add on to that, I joined uh, in 2017, I joined a commercial real estate company, a boutique commercial real estate in the city, and they only allowed email into their organization in 2015. So like, think through that, like there are still companies that are operating very manually. And that's how we, you operated, you Bring know, mimeograph the machines. The oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I love a little envelope. Oh, mm. little, little yellow envelope to get your memos together. Y'all, we have been through this before. We will get through this together. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Um, Tar, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you. Um, the next question is like, how do you promote transparency, trust, and effective communication regarding AI usage throughout the organization, especially among skeptical employees and leaders? This is the thing, and I, I'm going to go back to this again. Um, if you don't have trust and transparency already within your organization, solid chance the AI is not going to be the one thing that moves the needle so that you are actually going to make them understand AI. Like there has to be an element of your employees trusting you. Obviously, that's why I love Culture Amp so much because you have resources to be able to measure those kinds of things. But like, if you don't have it already, this is not going to be your magic wand to make it happen. So you've got to probably go back to the basics and the studs and figure out what's your strategy for, you know, in 
making sure employees feel like safe and value psychological safety, that there's growth, right? That they're able to move through the organization, that you have a solid learning and development plan, that they're measuring engagement and retention, like all of those things. And then you add AI as part of the other things that you should be talking about, like business performance, right? Like strategy, like what's your goal for this year? What's Q4's goal? It's no different. You still, you still So you can't separate them because then people feel compartmentalized already so they don't know what to trust, right? There's a lot of trust, I think, in organizations right now that's that that needs to be repaired. And so if you want to like dial it back a little bit and use this as one of the you know reasons why you want to do that. But at the end of the day, your people can't if without your people you can't execute the, execute the business strategy that you have so you can you know think that you know people teams and the rest are like administrative and whatever because a lot of leaders do think that they don't think hr is sexy so they don't want to pay attention to it they're like you go figure out how to pay them well and grow or whatever but nonetheless when it comes to strategy everyone wants to talk about like oh look at this new shiny product we've launched right they're both equally important so without the people you can't execute your strategy so if you can't communicate to your people then you're probably not having a strong business as to begin with okay tar we see you <laughs> <laughs> I really take to heart that invitation to use this as an impetus for some of the long needed repair in our in our organizations. And two additional thoughts. There is a major gap in individuals' concerns being heard, particularly with regards to fears around job displacement and AI, AI and the effect that it will have on our planet. Um, climate considerations. These are valid concerns. And I think leaders are um, are wise to make the time to listen before, before they speak. Um, the other thing, you know, there are a lot of ways to involve workers, all of us. Uh, I, I include myself when I use that word. Um, ways to involve workers as stakeholders in the design, the selection, the implementation of AI technology. You can solicit ideas from workers on how to implement the technology and involve them in planning, um, including for internal training that we should all be in the muscle of offering really regularly. Um, I think a great place to start is asking employees about friction points in their existing workflows. What are the things that don't feel like the highest, best use of your time? And can we automate some of those away? Um, and then finally, because I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about this idea, really select with your employees and your hourly workers, vendors that prioritize human-centered design. Ask about how they include primary users, not just the purchasers, um, in identifying addressable needs, input, and expectations of their software. As we all know, there's very often a gap between the person procuring the software and the person who's using it day to day. And they both need to be involved in these in these decisions. Yeah, great delineation, Emily, because I hadn't thought of it that way, that the people who are procuring it and the users, those perspectives are differently. And so, and so I really appreciate that. And the other point before I come over to you, Teresa, I, I appreciate that you said, Emily, is that what I heard you say is that being employee centric in this as we are on this journey and inviting your workers on that journey with you, which is very important. So I really appreciate you highlighting that. Teresa, anything you add to that? Yeah, I keep having to find that mute button. Uh, I would, I ditto what Tara and Emily said. I put in the chat, one of the things that I've heard quite a bit that leads into that need for us to embrace our employees' experience is the number one, the recognition that most people are trying it if they're not using their own paid subscription to it, um, whether our company has said something about it or not. And the worst case scenario that I've heard a few times is people feeling like they're cheating by using AI and how detrimental that can be to the psyche of somebody who's trying to do really good work and feels like they're breaking the law or breaking organizational expectations or using a tool to that really is there to help amplify what they're doing, but perceive themselves to be doing something wrong and making it something almost mentally that is punishable. And so if we're not talking about 
AI in a manner that is open and engaging, that doesn't mean that you have to create a free for all for the way AI is used, but having some guide guide rails and and incorporating that comfort with employees that it's okay to talk about. I worked with one client, I had this conversation maybe two weeks ago, where when I asked her, you know, we were talking about how the company is viewing AI and she had sort of a memory of, I remember eight months ago, we said to everybody that they shouldn't explore these tools yet because they were too new and we haven't said anything else after that. And so she's employing me to help integrate AI with their company and run learning sessions, but we have to start from the place of, okay, now we're saying that this is, we've changed our position and that's okay too. If, if COVID taught us anything, being agile and shifting is super important. So, you know, I think that's that's a lesson learned. Great point. Thank you so much for mentioning that, Teresa. And we got a couple questions left and we have about 15 minutes left in our session. And I want to come back to you, Tara and Teresa. Um, when we think about the number of generations that we have in the workplace right now, I think we have around like five generations in today's workplace. How does that impact AI adoption? Like what are some potential risks and watch outs associated? What should we be thinking about when we think about the number of generations that we have? We have the most generations actually in today's workplace. I actually read the other day there are six instead of five. So six. yeah. So what I will say is when when we talk about generations, let us we are generally speaking, like this is not specific. We've got outliers, like there are some people who are gonna not like it's just a sort of a grouping uh, and a, a, a collection of norm of behaviors that people study. So you could be amazing and outside of not you know not. I'm a gener a Gen Xer, so I'm probably going to say that yes, we are the leaving me alone generation. I can say that that's the truth. Um, but I think what we need to talk about is really like how can we best support one another, and it goes back again to what are you doing internally from your communication strategy, your learning and development strategy like all of these different things so that you understand how people need to receive information. If I did get one thing out of my theater degree, my master's degree, where my parents were like, why did you go to school to do theater? Well, I learned how to talk so people could hear me rather than me just talking so that I could hear myself. I think that's a huge business lesson because what we need to make sure we're doing is talking to these you know, groups of people who are coming together probably for the first time outside of maybe their family that construct, right? which probably sometimes is not the one you want to mirror anyway, because it could be either great or fraught with stress during like the holidays or whatever, but we're in a workplace. We're there to collaborate. We're there for, for goal. We have goals. So how can we talk to one another to make those goals even better? And I think when you go back to AI, it's a matter of understanding, like with all the tools that you have in Slack and like email, you know, like what are your preferences? I like to have, like as one of my clients, since, um, you know, I have my own consulting business, I like to have people fill out a whole like, little about me section that they can give people. This is how I like to communicate. These are the times that really work best for me. Um, you know, that way you can talk about like what works best for you. Do you want to use AI? Do you like Slack? Like, how can we be a little bit more vulnerable so that we're understanding what we're talking about when, and we're not doing sort of pitting uh, each other against one another? Because so talk to people, like use your you know, culture amp surveys, use your charter information, like all of these different things, use people who can come in and help you facilitate those conversations. Like Teresa, like there are ways to do this. You don't have to stay stagnant and you don't have to rely on old information or, you know, the kind of, um, assumptions that you make just by reading because we already know like there's so much misinformation out there. Go to people who do this for a living. Like it's really easy. Yeah, there's an African proverb, um, Tara. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Coming over to you, Teresa. Yeah, I love that. I think the fifth or the sixth uh, generation, uh, Marta Abel just put it in the chat, is the Zennial. So I, I think that's often missed as a Gen Xer as well. So uh, happy uh, shout out to the forgotten generation, if you will. Um, I think what's amazing about AI is that, and I come from a mindset of abundance on it. Really, I do. I It's important. I talk about being cautiously optimistic. I talk about really thinking about the ways that Emily mentioned you can vet and, and ensure these tools are responsibly built as much as possible and, uh, you know, are biased 
to the extent, again, built by humans bias reduced. But I also think that there are really abundant ways in which each generation may differently use AI based on where they are in their career cycle, right? You have baby boomers and Gen Xers who may be in leadership roles that could use AI to help them understand improved leadership skills. I would argue that even though we have many, many executives and leaders, we don't have a abundance of really amazing leaders and managers of companies. Now we have a lot, but there's a, there's some, some runway there. So how could AI be used as a tool for them? And also to capture their, their knowledge and, and what, they, what they have inherently as a result of experience um, by using it to build things like feeding a custom GPT or building their your own organizational bots or your own organizational AI uh, or your own organizational LLMs. Um, additionally, you have people entering the workforce, navigating how to um, communicate as a first time hire, what, what an organization needs from new employees and how that new perspective can help enhance what an organization is already doing. And I talk about the use of AI as a coach and mentor a lot, because I think that there are so often things that we do in the world of work, whether you're a millennial or you're a zennial or whatever, wherever you are in that like first time leader, first time manager role, where things are happening in the moment and you don't have time to wait for the opportunity for your weekly one-on-one -on -one or a conversation with a leader to figure out what to do. And AI can get you on a good track. So I love that like intergeneration, intergenerational use might look different, but there is a universality to it that doesn't, you know, mean that you can't, it doesn't apply to you regardless of what generation, age range, and or I would say the same thing applies gender wise. Yeah, I love it. That's a great point. Thank you for calling that out, Teresa. I really appreciate that. And, you know, building off of that, we've been talking a lot about the various use cases with AI and how we can adopt it. And I want to ask this question quickly. When we talk about AI, like, what are we not talking about, you know, in the AI discourse? What haven't you seen us talking about? And Emily, I want to actually come over to you on that one. Sure. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to see us meaningfully discuss more in our workplace is the role of agency and resistance to AI. Um, I think many of the considerations we've been giving voice to today only work if people have the option to opt out. Um, and that that's really important that they are presented with all possible information and given and given choices about how they can best work. Um, there's an example. This is a little bit different from AI, but I, I thought that this was um, was really thought provoking. Um, we talked to, um, and it's from the world of robotics. Um, there's a New Zealand hospitality and hotel company called Hind Management, and over the past year, it's used, it's introduced robotic assistants to clear restaurant tables, deliver housekeeping supplies, um, and facilitate room service with with these Bella bots. Um, and this is work that is all very physically labor intensive. Um, and Christine Hearing, who directs workplace experience there says, the robots are not there to serve our guests. Our purpose was to help our people. Um, and when she rolled out training, she found that some tenured staff who worked for the company for 20 plus years were initially reluctant to use the technology. And, um, her response is very much backed by the research literature, which um, managers can help set the stage, providing psychological safety and and encouragement, um, while also giving people the option to non to not have to use or not have to to go along. And um, she told me that no one will be disadvantaged by choosing to forego the robotic assistance. Um, she's, she did say that many employees now do choose it. They opt in um, and they spend their time saved talking to guests. They Many of them report less physical strain, but ultimately the call is theirs. I love that. I'm going to say this. I'm just going to say I, my, my miss or kind of what's not happening in the discourse, this is going to sound like a layup, but was exactly what Emily said. Not using the robotics example, 
full, but using the fact that there are a lot of CEOs that I've talked with, you know, people that report to the CEOs or the CEOs that are creating this like organizational mandate to explore, not many, but some. And I found that, you know, a, a good balance of people that are calling me. In fact, I have a, a company locally here in Connecticut that has this sort of mandate we must adopt. And the two people that are responsible for bringing that, making that happen and talking with me, I can tell both in their words, in their tone, in their, that there's a reticence to it. Um, they're also in a legacy business. They've been there for 25 years. And so I think being cautious around the psychological safety, but also the technological, the, the sense that I have to maybe move more technologically advanced than than what AI provides is, a, is another piece. But I did want to tag on because I, I love everything Emily says and I just totally wanted to steal her point. Thank <laughs> you. I'm going to actually tag on to Teresa's because I think what we're not talking about is actually what AI is and it isn't. Like I'm going to go back to the studs, like the studs of it all. Because I don't know if there's a lot of people who even understand like what it is. Like I've seen people on Twitter who are like, AI is rejecting my resume. And I was like, it's just not quite how that works out. But people are using the term broadly without understanding the mechanisms behind it. And I, I've literally seen one company who rolled it out. I would, I want to say it was like last year, what they did is they brought in an ex expert who builds from one of the consulting companies, privatized AI environments for companies. And what he did was he took a very complex FP&A policy and he just used a chat and he said, can you write this FP&A policy for me? He'd already talked to the CFO of the company we're talking a whole like, like, uh, you know, like ballroom full of people in a hotel, in a hotel who've been at this company for 20 plus years. Look at this thing, literally spit out nine to 10 pages of a very complex FP&A policy that was accurate and shivering in their boots because they're like, what? And then he said, write the policy in the tone of my CFO. Here's his LinkedIn profile. Okay, that literally made everybody want to run out and they're all so so here that's please don't do that, right? Like don't, don't instill fear in people by saying this big bad tool is going to come for your job and here's how great it is. There's a way to have a conversation about what it is by bringing in an expert and saying like this is what AI does, this is how we've been using it, here's how we can use it, this is why we're talking about it so much like take people along with the journey. We're not talking about that enough because I feel like we just keep using the term AI and it just keeps compounding on these fears that people have about like what the big bad Oz is going to take away from them. And like, that's like the critical part of just being very simple. Can we get an amen for like stopping <laughs> using the term? Um, stop using the statement AI isn't going to take your job. Somebody who knows AI is going to take your job. Can we stop with that yes. fear factor approach to like learning? This is yeah. about curiosity and the possible. That doesn't yeah. mean the everything, but the possible. Thank you for that, Tara. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> I'll give you an amen. <laughs> just piling on um, as leaders, we can't see the future. How do we expect that other leaders can? Like, I would just invite us all to think about, can we do this in a way where we're, we don't share rash predictions um, or opinions? That last part, that last part. Oh my goodness. Like we could go on forever. I have one more question before, you know, I close this out and this is so, so rich. And Teresa, I'm going to come back to you um, on this one. Um, what is one action today that our that our attendees can um, can either start or improve, you know, on their AI journey? I'm gonna cheat and do two. Okay. <laughs> the, the first one is go to somebody in your organization, in your department, in your leadership, and ask them if and how they're using AI. That's just ask the question, start the dialogue and the discourse. The second one is if you have not explored tools outside of chat GPT, just explore one, Claude. Um, there's so many perplexity. There's just a ton of tools. A lot of them offer free entree for a few days. It's worth the effort to try. 
Thank you, Teresa. I think I'll say, um, one, this is a perfect time to audit your programs and your strategies overall as people organizations. Like you can, again, use AI as an impetus to be able to do this, but how strong are the, you know, learning and development, internal comms, employee engagement, retention, onboarding, all of those things that you can easily measure. Um, how are those, how strong are those? And um, really kind of pay attention to that. And then also, please, by all means, just pay somebody who's an AI expert who will not install fear into people and just walk through an AI 101 and say like, this is what it is. This is what it isn't. What questions do you have? Like demystify the fear so we can make people feel like we're not having this elite conversation that goes above their heads. Yeah. Yeah. We have Teresa on the call, everybody. <laughs> um, Emily, I'm coming over to you. I mean, this conversation has been so rich coming over to you, Emily. Like, what is one action that our attendees can take, you know, to either start or improve their journey? Pay people with relevant expertise is plus 100. The other, ask who within my organization or the organizations I work with is most likely to be brought along and see financial benefit. Who is least likely? And what processes can we use to make sure that this isn't the case? I just go back to responsible AI principles there. Boom, that was a perfect way to close that out. Thank you so much, Emily, for sharing that. If you all can please join me in the chat and give a big round of applause to Emily, Teresa, and Tara for this very insightful conversation. And I am just so grateful that you all jammed out with us today about this. And one more thing before folks go, we do have a treat for you that we want to share with you. Um, we also just want to quickly say that we're so grateful and so thankful to our partners over at Charter, who today is offering our attendees 50% off their first three months of a monthly subscription. Thank you all so much, Emily, for being so generous. I did. That. <laughs> I did. You'll love it. Scan that QR code. So worth it. So worth it. <laughs> And we'll drop this in the chat and Jesse and I in our follow-up email will also include this in there, but use that promo code culture 50. Thank you so much to our friends over at charter. Thank you, Emily, Teresa, and Tara. And I also want to let you know, Jesse going to drop this in the chat as well before she closes this out. Our culture first global virtual experience is happening May 14th through 15th in North America, APAC and, and, and EMEA. We have the renowned Esther Perel, who's our first time ever external advisor, Megan Rapino and Ben Crow, who will all be speaking among some amazing customer speakers. So if you aren't registered, what are you waiting for? Be there. So Jesse, go ahead, close us out. Oh my gosh. So good. I have so many notes. Can't wait to use generative AI to sum it all up for me and put it into a LinkedIn <laughs> post. <laughs> um, so thank you all so much. Um, I would love to do a, um, a clap out with you all. So if you haven't been to a culture first uh, gathering before. This is another great tool that you can use at your events, whether it's in person or virtual. So what we're going to do, we're all going to come off mute. And uh, after the count of three, we're all going to clap. And then the Zoom meeting's just going to shut off. Okay. So Demario, you're going to shut, you got it. You can shut us off. You good for that? All right. Let me pull it up. Okay. Let all me know. Right. And then uh, Teresa, will you count us to three? Would you be willing to be our person? I love it. So good. All okay. right. Everyone Everyone come off mute, uh, get ready. We're going to clap. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, <laughs> let's keep the convo going in people geek slack. Uh, we'll see a culture first global cheers to co-creating a better world of work. Everyone over to you, Teresa. One, two, warm it up, warm it up, three.